here? If I can have, uh, who's my faculty still? Steve, uh, Dr. Larson, Dr. Shaw. We'll take just about 20 minutes of uh, questions and answers here. We had several, Amy and her uh, magic Facebook uh, email. She really is paying attention. She's just, we're getting email questions back in from people watching this live. Uh, I was really cool. I was watching myself live a few minutes ago. I'm, I'm not as good as I thought I was. So <laughs> don't, don't, don't watch it, Steve. It's not worth it. So <laughs> here, just sit down, Amy. You can relax there. That's cool. All right, let, let's, uh, if there are questions from the audience, come to the microphone. Uh, come to one of the microphones so I can hear that. Um, Dr. Schaub, we didn't really talk much about the role of thyroglobulin this morning and how we use thyroglobulin in follow-up as a tumor marker. Can you say a few words about that? Indeed. Uh, as you recall, those of you who heard the presentation, the colloid that Dr. Tuttle showed you, which is the component of the normal thyroid gland, contains thyroglobulin, a, a protein produced by the thyroid gland which reflects the presence of thyroid cells. That could be normal thyroid cells, or that could be from malignant thyroid cells or cancer. So either way, if there is any thyroid tissue, whether benign or malignant, persistent in your body, either in the normal thyroid gland, or in, in the cancer, or in the lymph glands, or elsewhere, it would produce that protein, which would be reflected in your blood as thyroglobulin. Remember, it's not an absolute test, but certainly elevated thyroglobulin would raise a, a bell of caution that we should look further as to where this is coming from. It's a simple blood test, essentially non-invasive test, and can be used for surveillance after surgery to see the activity of your thyroid cancer. Is it coming back? If your thyroglobulin has been not measurable for two years after surgery, and suddenly on a follow-up visit, it jumps to five or 10, that's a bell that you should pay attention to. Let's look what's going on. Very good. This question from the audience? Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you all of you uh, in the panel. Your information has been amazing. Um, I have a reflection and a question, I, I guess. Um, Maybe I'll start with the reflection. I just, I'm a registered dietitian and a diabetes educator, so I hope this comment doesn't come across as a quack, um, because I'm familiar with those practitioners that were listed on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so I did want to just mention, um, because I do work with a lot of thyroid cancer patients and a lot of thyroid patients as well, and I have worked with a lot of patients who've had a poor experience taking levothyroxine drugs, even the brand name, and so some of them use T3, some of them use natural thyroid, and one bit that I just wanted to add, I, I believe it used to be measured by weight and iodine content, but now it's regulated by the USP, so they, they do standardize the T4 and the T3 content, so just I just wanted to mention that bit in case anybody else is interested in it, because this is my question. Um, I've read in the ATA guidelines that thyroid cancer patients often have subclinical or low T3, serum T3, either total or free, and it's been stated that the clinical significance is unknown, like how is this going to affect a patient, but I have, I guess, anecdotal experience with patients feeling poorly in this situation, myself being one, but others as well, so I wondered what is your take on sure. that? So, Lauren, uh, the, I mean, routinely we all see, you know, 80 or 90 percent of people on Synthroid do fine. They feel great. There's that 10 percent or so that always come out on Saturday mornings and email. And that's a real, they don't feel good. And you measure the blood test, and the T4 is fine. And sure enough, the T3 is a little bit low. Uh, what do you tell folks like that? I do believe that some people have low T3s. So I'm not telling you they don't. And those people, I have been supplementing with T3, and I give it as a separate pill, and usually a low dose of the separate pill because, as I said before, you can get really jumpy from the T3, and if anything, I don't want to give people too much T3. It's a small minority, a real minority of the population, but I think you're right. 
in the sense that we're recognizing it more and more, and people were not routinely testing T3. But this is usually in the hypothyroid population, not in the thyroid cancer population where we're trying to suppress. If anything, most of them can make enough T3 because we're giving them enough T4, if you know what I mean. We're keeping them rather high. I would have a real problem if the TSH is low and the T4 is normal or a little bit high and the T3 is low because some of those patients we're not quite sure how to treat appropriately and some of them might even have a pituitary problem. I'm not saying that I know about everybody and, and that's a different story again and I have some patients who are pituitary patients and the treatment of those patients is the most complex because you really want to balance with a correct T4 level. And what you learn in, in medical school, what you learn in your residency before an endocrine fellowship is that TSH is the primary test and that's all you should treat to, whether it's hypothyroidism or thyroid cancer. But there are a lot of patients who are somewhat more complex than just looking at the TSH, even if that's the right board question in internal medicine. Yeah, I think the, the good news is you guys have convinced us that there are some people that just don't feel perfect on levothyroxine alone. And we're trying to figure out who those guys are and how best to help you. So 10 years ago, everybody just sort of ignored that. I think now all of us say we recognize that's a problem and we're trying to figure out how best to deal with it. Next question. Hi, I have a question on the increasing incidence of thyroid cancer that we mentioned in the beginning. Um, so does that have to do perhaps, you also talked a bit, Dr. Tuttle and Dr. Shaha, about how sensitive the diagnostic um, materials are now that we have. Um, does the incidence have any relation to the fact that we have extremely sensitive diagnostic tests, or is it all due to environmental factors or other things we don't know about? Yeah, I'll do that one. I, I think it's largely being driven by the sensitivity of our test. Um, in the old days, we couldn't feel these little millimeter-sized things that you can see on the ultrasound now. When I was a fellow, we didn't biopsy anything less than one or one and a half centimeters, and we're biopsying things one-tenth that size now. So I think a large part of that iceberg underneath the thing was little teeny tiny stuff that we're just finding with ultrasounds and those things, absolutely. Um, Amy, online question. What was one of the topics there? Okay, so we have several online questions today. I'm gonna to start with um, one that's a little bit earlier in the thyroid cancer process uh, regarding radioactive iodine treatment. We have a patient who is doing outpatient treatment and she wanted to know um, how long she should remain isolated from her family following her radioactive, radioactive iodine treatment, as well as if she will contaminate inanimate items. Steve, this is always great, because you guys always swear to us that this stuff is safe, and then you hand it to us on some tongs <laughs> as you're trying to rush out of the room. So what's, what's the story with how safe this really is, and what do we tell people when they go home? Well, I think, you know, every therapy of this kind, especially uh, radioactive iodine, uh, which now is it's possible to do radioactive iodine in the United States as an outpatient. And the benefits of that are you can, uh, you can at least see your family. You can also, uh, it's a lot cheaper than the inpatient treatment, and there's a much less sense of isolation. So after careful consideration, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission decided that they would uh, investigate uh, to see how much radiation exposure actually was, was given from patients who, were, who had received radioactive on it. And they found that it was, that if proper precautions were taken, that it was less than the population limit of 500 millirems. Uh, so that if you get 250 millicuries now at our center, then you can be sent uh, home. But first, it's not quite so simple because first of all, as I mentioned, the nuclear medicine physician will sit with you and take a detailed questionnaire which has been printed out in collaboration with our radiation safety group. And we have a relatively large radiation safety group and those of you who were treated here at Memorial Sloan Kettering, I'm sure, will remember Chris Horan, who's one of the radiation safety uh, people who come around and make measurements, but also serve a very important role in advising patients about these very questions. 
So patients must agree to follow a certain regimen when they do go home. If you have small children, in general, there's a period of time where you don't hold the child. If you uh, normally sleep with your spouse, there's a period of time where you don't uh, uh, sleep with your spouse. In general, these intervals are short, fairly short, a few days to a week. And also, distances can be maintained uh, from, from individuals in your home. Let's say your pregnant daughter is living with you with her, with, it, with her spouse for a period of time. You just maintain a distance. Um, now, I can't tell specifically from the question what the, what the time interval would be, but I, I do say that I hope that she's been given advice from a qualified radiation safety officer and that this has actually been part of a plan. It really is computed in a worksheet uh, as to these kinds of numbers. So at least at Memorial, we're very careful about that and instruct patients. Uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the criteria that we use is that the patients must, we must believe that the patients can comply with these orders. If people, uh, let's say, are not, uh, have a limited intelligence or may, may have uh, be uh, schizophrenic or whatever, then of course they would need to be treated as an inpatient if they were going to get high doses so that they could be monitored uh, all the time. Yeah, so what I find is endocrinologists and well-meaning family practice doctors give these really long stay away from people for three weeks, four weeks, 18 years, something like that. So the nuclear medicine guys know all about this. That's a discussion that you can have with them. They know the dose you're giving and it's usually much shorter than what we'd appreciate. Amy, what's the next topic? Um, yes, Patricia would like to ask about memory problems in thyroid cancer survivors. We tend to hear a lot about that in our online community. <coughs> Dr. Green, because you, you told us you just fixed their thyroid hormone, everybody's perfect. Everybody's great. I always forget to come to your meetings because my thyroid's not right. What, what about this memory stuff and this kind of, I can't find the right words, I, I never used to have this problem, I'm running my business, I lost my dog, what's, what's this memory story? I think memory is a general problem in our society that has nothing to do with so thyroid Dr. cancer. So Dr. Green, are you taking the blame for anything whatsoever? I forgot, what was the question? <laughs> no, I, I, what I wanna say is we're all not getting enough sleep. We're all working 24 seven. We're all multitasking if we're working. Um, and I think one of the best things that I've heard is the term sleep hygiene, which is pretty funny. Uh, the sleep hygiene means turn off the internet, all your connectivity two hours before you go to sleep if you want to get a good night's sleep. The computer can go to bed before you go to bed, including your cell phone, including your texting, including anything that's interactive. If you watch TV, you're not interacting except whatever emotions you have and, and everything else. I mean, if you read a book, you're certainly not interacting on the same way. You're using the right and left sides of your brain all the time. You go to one of these little handheld devices that we're you know, so attached to now. I mean, there was life before the cell phone, I think. <laughs> I hardly remember that too, but I'm not sure. But I think there was. Um, get up and exercise more. Um, my, one of my famous quotes I give to patients all the time is that if Mount Vesuvius erupted over Manhattan Island, Pete, the archaeologists would come and discover that we had these elaborate clothes hangers called exercise machines. <laughs> I, I mean, go out and enjoy the fresh air on a day like today. I think we need to unstress. And if you unstress and if you get more sleep, and I'm talking to myself, don't do as I say, don't do as I do, um, I think we'll all have somewhat better memories. I mean, caffeine helps. Oh God. I only read the articles where caffeine is good for you. Do not read the articles where caffeine is bad for you, but caffeine cures everything. If you read the caffeine is bad for you articles, you'll just get confused, and I don't want to be confused. That's I want to know great. the caffeine So is the good next video, the next person shows, is her saying caffeine cures everything. It does. Was, it does. Was there a question? to decide which one to ask. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll give you two. Go for it. Oh, you will give me two. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, Dr. Tuttle, you, you um, started off with the overview about um, how this there's a higher incidence in thyroid cancer. There's talk about maybe because of 
um, and overdiagnosis and, and ultrasounds. Um, but there's been this stable mortality rate, and which is a good thing, but that's with treatment. So I'm curious to know about what you all think about those that are walking around with thyroid cancer. They don't know it, and they never knew it, and they died of old age or natural causes and never treated it, yet then there's some people that find it, and then they have to decide, should I take out a fun functioning thyroid or not? And could I live 50 years and never know? Because there's plenty of people that are walking around they don't know, and yeah. they probably will not suffer from it. So yeah. what, what is your take it's, on that? It's a real challenge. Um, we now have somewhere around 220 or 230 patients that somebody biopsied one of these really small thyroid cancers that we're just following with observation. Uh, we've had the discussion with them about doing surgery or not doing surgery, and many of them are older patients, and we think the risk outweighs the benefit. So in individual patients, we give them the option. In the new ATA guidelines, it's actually going to say if you have one of these very low-risk thyroid cancers, you should be given the option of watching and not rushing to surgery. It's very difficult to do because once you have a biopsy, then you know it's thyroid cancer. So I usually say I would first like to apologize that we found out that you had thyroid cancer. But now we know there it is, and we're going to have to follow it. The trade-off of that is, is obviously some of those are going to grow because every four centimeter cancer was originally a small cancer, right? So we're doing lots of work trying to figure out how do you tell who's going to grow? We're doing molecular studies. Can we tell from the biopsy which ones are going to grow? So I think the future really is being able on the small ones, watch them for a little bit. These don't get out of control in six months or a year. But it's a real challenge. It's a challenge for the people. The last thing I'll tell you is in the ATA guidelines, we're going to say not to biopsy this little small stuff. Just don't. Five millimeters, six millimeters, that you're not supposed to stick a needle into it. You're supposed to just repeat an ultrasound. And that I find people a little bit easier to follow. So we're still trying to figure out all the details of it, and you're asking the right question, but at least we're moving ahead. Yeah. Well, other question. This more refers to um, pathology a little bit. Um, I know from what I've read, and I don't even have a science background, but from follicular cells under the microscope, they can be very difficult to determine if they're benign or malignant. And then there's this talk about this variant of follicular, follicular cancers, which is really a, a variant of a papillary, and that there's going to be a re, there might be a reclassification um, because it's encapsulated. And I'm and I and that's really not acting like a cancer, so why take it out? So I'm. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Holy cow. Okay, so you're current. She knows too much. <laughs> uh, you you want to come up here? coming up here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, because. I do have a life. I just read a lot. <laughs> you clearly have too much spare time. So <laughs> you're current as of about 10 days ago, because 10 days ago we decided probably to change the name of this. So what we're talking about in generality is there are, there are we talked about risk stratification. The, you can define very specific types of thyroid cancer, like redheaded thyroid cancer, yellow-headed, blonde, fat, skinny thyroid cancer, some of which that hardly behave like a cancer at all. And what she's specifically talking about is the encapsulated variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. The name doesn't matter, but there's a group that its risk of recurrence is less than 1%. They're cured with half a thyroid alone. So the pathologists are also getting into this risk stratified theme that Dr. Shaw has been trying to get us to do for all these years. And you're starting to see now pathologists say this is a very low risk, this is what low risk looks like. And then that allows the endocrinologist to say, okay, maybe I don't need to treat this one as aggressively. Um, Lauren, we really haven't talked much about follow-up. We, we did the talks this morning about surgery and radioactive ion and stuff. When the usual sort of lowish intermediate risk patient has their surgery, it's a papillary cancer, a couple positive lymph nodes, you might or might not done radioactive iodine. Well, what's that follow-up look like in your clinic? When do they come back? What do you do that first year or two? The first year is still more intensive in my office. I, I tend to like to follow people every three months or so. Uh, once I know they're on a stable dose of thyroid hormone, and as I said before, it's getting to be less thyroid suppression in the low-risk patients by their pathology. In the high-risk patients, more thyroid hormone is used in my office, and um, I think at other people at NYU, we tend to suppress the TSH more unless we're limited by the more immediate concerns about cardiac disease in the elderly. And again, sometimes you get killed by your heart attack before you get killed by your thyroid cancer, obviously. 
But after a while, I'm usually down to a one-year follow-up and people are pretty comfortable. The one-year follow-up is in my hands is usually a TSH, uh, I like free T4 still, and a thyroglobulin level, as well as a once-a-year neck ultrasound. Okay. And uh, of course, an examination and see how the patient feels. And if you can stay in the office for a longer time to talk about other issues, all these other issues usually come up from brain fog that everybody's having, even my non-thyroid patients, to everything else. But, um, but then people have all kinds of other concerns, like will selenium help? Well, selenium seems to be very important in thyroid function, and selenium is very in right now. In general, for thyroid, if you want to look up a uh, in, in supplement, um, it's not something that I would emphasize, except in pregnancy now, we are giving selenium in vitamins and iodine requirements in pregnancy have gone up. Um, and I think that's important to know, and it's the pregnant women who are most concerned about uh, if they have a history of thyroid cancer or have a history of other thyroid problems. Uh, and most of the prenatal vitamins are being reformulated to add more iodine and sometimes selenium to the uh, prenatal vitamins. One of the reasons is that the iodine content is now going down in the United States. I don't know if many of you know about that, but um, the major source of iodine in the diet has been milk. And it's not the cows are going around putting out so much iodine, it's that the milking equipment has so much iodine. And if we go to alternate sources of cleaning off the cow's udders, and the milking equipment, besides betadine or other forms of iodine, we're gonna have lower iodine in cow's milk. So it's been a natural experiment that nobody had planned, but if you don't use iodine, then you might have a lower iodine content in milk. Dr. Shaw, let's ask one more question before we stop for the morning. It has to do with recurrent thyroid cancer. As, as was mentioned before, our testing is really good not only at finding thyroid <coughs> cancer, but also finding some little persistent thyroid cancer after you do your surgery. Sometimes I find big lymph nodes that need to be dealt with. Often I find little small stuff. Um, how do you help me sort of decide what do we do about that? Can we watch some of that? Do I biopsy? How do we handle that? So I think, you know, the same philosophy that you employ in early diagnosis or overdiagnosis of patients or people trying to find a small cancer should be applied in follow-up also. As much as Dr. Green would like to do an annual ultrasound, I'm not quite a fan of this for the following reason. If we took every single patient with thyroid cancer, a small papillary cancer, they have a 50% risk of having microscopic thyroid cancer cells in their lymph glands. Of those 50%, 48 to 49% will never come to life, and they will live with that, and they will live a normal lifespan. So by doing very close and very uh, rigorous ultrasound follow-up examinations, often you will find a tiny lymph node, four, five millimeter, somebody will do a needle biopsy, and now you bought yourself an operation that you did not need because that four or five millimeter lymph node can be in you for the rest of your life and may never grow. So generally, yes, we would do ultrasound in the first couple of years, uh, perhaps every six months for the first year, the next couple of years once a year, but thereafter we are becoming less and less aggressive in following with ultrasound because these tiny lymph nodes don't mean anything and taking them out once doesn't guarantee that they won't come back on the other side of the neck or in the same side. So you, you may wind up buying yourself unnecessary three or four operations over the course of the next 20, 30, 40 years. So I think if one needs to use discretion, and this is where again the risk stratification comes in. If you are at the outset a low risk patient, there is no need or there is no urgency or no rationale even to be finding tiny lymph nodes which may have papillary cancer, but they don't mean anything. If something is a centimeter or bigger, yes, they, need, they should be paid attention to and taken out. But two, three, four millimeter lymph nodes can be safely followed. 
Yeah. So we're in a situation that our technology's gotten a little bit ahead of us. We can detect really little stuff. I think it's generally good, but we have to be careful that we don't hurt people as we're going ahead. We're going to stop there for the morning. Uh, we're going to start back at 1 o'clock New York time. For the Internet folks, that'll be right on the hour. Um, and we're having lunch across the way. Joan says yes. We'll stop. And thank you this morning for the speakers very much. Thank you.